things you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Mostly Photo is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Mostly Photo with Lisa Bettany and Leo Laporte. Episode 6, recorded April 26th, 2011. Thomas Hawk. Mostly Photo is brought to you by Ford and the 100% reinvented 2011 Ford Explorer. With its thoughtful design, room for seven passengers, best in class V6 highway fuel economy, and available sync with my Ford Touch, the 2011 Ford Explorer is perfect for your adventures with the family and your camera. For more information and to submit your photos for the Mostly Photo Adventure Awards, visit MostlyPhotoAdventures.com. It's time for Mostly Photo, and here she is, ladies and gentlemen, the star of our show from New York, New York, Mostly <laughs> Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Hello. Time to talk photography with Lisa Bettany, and we're going to find out how your uh, photo walk went. It was just a couple of days ago in the Big Apple. It was. It was amazing. We had an amazing group. Every time we have a photo walk, I'm amazed at who turns up, and we had some amazing photographers. Fun. We don't have a video this time, but we'll, maybe next week we'll have a video that we can show people from the walk. We do have winners, I am happy to say, in our Mostly Photo Adventure mm -hmm. Awards. Those are Ew. coming up in just a little bit. But would you introduce our special guest? Our special guest is Thomas Hawk, and if you don't know, <laughs> he is an amazing San Francisco-based photographer. And I think he should do the introduction because it's really confusing what you do. Well, I'm going to so say, you... I'll, let me say something then uh, real quickly is just that I've been following Thomas for a long time online. We've never met, but, uh, you know, I know several things about Thomas. First of all, he's amazingly prolific. He makes incredibly beautiful uh, pictures and he posts a huge number online and he has been a staunch advocate, as I know you have too, Lisa, because you get busted all the time. For the right of photographers to take photos in public. So, Thomas, welcome to uh, Mostly Photo. Hey, thanks, Leo. Thanks, Lisa. Glad to be here. It's great. It's great, it's great to finally meet you. Congratulations on the show. Thank you. Um, how long have you been a photographer? Uh, I started shooting when I was like seven or eight with an old Kodak Instamatic and uh, took a lot of film pictures back then, but didn't really start getting into it until I was about 15 and got my first SLR and uh, rode, rode my bike across America one summer and took a wow. bunch of pictures and yeah, so I've been shooting since I've been a young kid and, um, edited my college yearbook and newspaper and always had access to a dark room and, um, got into digital photography though. That really kind of kicked things off about, uh, I guess 2003, 2004, some of the early cameras. Did you like a lot of film photographers fight it at first? You know, I didn't, no. I, I just reached out for it. I saw it as an, another way to make photographs. Uh, my own style, which is to, I think, tend to overshoot a lot of things, it, it was really conducive for that. And so, you know, I, I was one of the photographers that didn't fight it. I mean, my first digital camera was one of those old Sony Mavicas that you actually put a floppy disk Oh, my disc God, those are horrible. <laughs> yeah, weren't they? Yeah, you had to so, save on a floppy. And, of course, that tells you something about the size of the uh, image and the image. Yeah, was no, they were awful. But, you know, but even back then, I was experimenting with them. That wasn't my primary camera back then. But, right. um, but you know, once the digital SLRs got good enough, I mean, I think I still hear some people, uh, you know, talk about how film is better and all that. But I, I just don't think there's comparison. I think digital is good enough today that uh, the advantage of, of it clearly outweigh film. Well, especially with somebody like you that shoots, as you said, so many pictures. Yeah. And, and you post how many? 50 a day? Yeah, I do 50 a day. I upload uh, 25 in the morning and then 25 at night to Flickr every day. Holy come on. Yeah. You know, it's funny because, uh, and by the way, I'm in your Flickr stream, which is yeah. flickr.com slash Thomas Hawk. Yep. Uh, and um, I, you know, Okay, I'm going to make a confession to you, Thomas. <laughs> uh, I I looked at your uh, your work, and I thought, oh my God, this guy is painstakingly by hand retouching all these photos. They're too damn good. <laughs> but now I know that can't be the case because uh, you couldn't do fifty a day. Well, you know, a lot of the the tools have made it easier. I mean, certainly Lightroom and things like that, but. No, I mean, every now and again, I'll get lost in Photoshop with a photo, you know, and I'll, I'll bring it in there, and then next thing you know, you look at the clock, and it's an hour later. And <laughs> so you like, do. What have I been doing? <laughs> you do have that experience. I have that experience, too. It's very easy yeah. to get sucked into these. So, 
sometimes, but you know, I, I have to produce a lot, and you know? so I shoot a lot. Um, I'm constantly shooting, and and I edit all the time. I mean, right. hours and hours and hours and hours and hours uh, in uh, in Lightroom, and and try to keep up. Do you, do you make your living doing this? You know, no, I don't. I mean, I, I sell a lot of photos and I sell stock photography and I've been publishing a lot of books and magazines and newspapers. And so I do make, uh, you know, money from it. Um, I sold some prints to the one ring con condo, um, oh, that's cool. last year. That's yeah. Cool. So I, I mean, I do sell, sell some stuff, but no, it's not a living. I mean, I've got, uh, well, what four, do you do for a living? Four kids and a mortgage. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> um, I'm in the investment business during the day. So so how do you find time to, f to shoot? Well, you know, I, I, I make a lot of time. I mean, for a while, probably the last five years or so, I've spent an awful lot of sort of everyday shooting stuff, just, you know, out walking around a couple hours after work, uh, you know, take a, a lunch hour, go out, shoot a bunch of stuff, um, a lot of stuff around San Francisco. Uh, lately, I've been doing a little bit less of that, and instead I've been focusing on these really intensive uh, trips. Um, one of the projects I'm working on is to shoot the hundred largest American cities. And so that's, that's <laughs> ambitious. You don't want yeah. to just do the top 10, huh? No, the hundred largest. <laughs> I'm be the next after that. <laughs> Some people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm trying to publish a million photos to Flickr before I die. So I've got big goals. But, wow. But, I mean, it, it's one thing if you're a full-time photographer, but you've yeah. got a day job, you've got a family. I know a lot of yeah. people uh, probably wonder, how to balance your, it's not a hobby, but how to balance your serious avocation with your, you know, your, your family life and your business, your professional life. Sure. Well, it's easy. You just cut out sleep. Ah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do get some sleep. Um, but no, I think you just have to take advantage. You can't waste time. I mean, when I'm on the BART riding home, I'm editing photos. Uh, you know, when I'm, you know, pretty much, you know, there's so much time we waste during the day, I think. And I mean, not that it's wasted time because there's time for relaxation and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't really watch television. I'm um, guessing that you find you find this relaxing, that this is your relaxation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, when I find an image and capture something just the way I want it and able to do something with it, it's, it's tremendously relaxing and tremendously satisfying. And while I probably could do photography professionally, for me, there's an immense amount of freedom in, uh, you know, just being able to shoot 100% what I want. And Lisa not, dropped off briefly, so I, she's back now. And I just want to fill you in on what you missed, Lisa. This isn't even his day job. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure that out um, based on your profiles because I honestly don't know how you produce it's the amazing. sheer amount of photography that you do. And that's really a big reason why I wanted to talk to you because I get a lot of photographers that ask me how they stay productive, how do they continually create um, photos and put them out there. And you're someone sure. that posts 50 Flickr photos every single day. And they're not just of one thing. You really have a great variety of shots from landscapes and architecture to people photos to street photos. So that's really why I wanted to get you on here and just ask you, how do you do this? Right. Yeah, no, I love talking about it. I mean, I, I think one thing, you know, I do tend to overshoot everything. So, you know, I've been doing these weekend trips where I'll go from like Friday to Monday to a city. So I shot Dallas and Fort Worth um, uh, in January and I'm shooting Houston next and uh, Austin and I'm going to go to Denver. But <laughs> When I go to these trips, it's not uncommon to come back with 15,000 frames. Your boss must be a very understanding <laughs> person. Are you self-employed? Well, well semi-self-employed, kind of. No, I mean, I, I, I'm a partner in a company. and um, But, you know, I, I could take a Monday and a Friday off, particularly yeah. on a long weekend. I'm going to, going to um, uh, Houston on Memorial Day weekend. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's on these trips, I'll come back with 15,000 photos. I do a lot of research before I go figure out what I want to shoot. I mean, Flickr is great for that. Right. We're doing research in the city. And, um, you know, so I'm pretty well prepared when I get there. And then it's just on those trips, it's, you know, like shoot 20 hours, sleep four, and um, just really kill myself. And I'm dead by the end of it. But I come back with 15,000 frames or so of so many different things and subjects. And um, and then and then I shoot a lot locally around here. You know, I took, took my boys, like I mentioned, out to Mare Island on Sunday and uh, – had a great time out there, and we did a for uh, the Flickr group that I'm involved with, the uh, Hot Box. Uh, we did a photo walk out on Mare Island a couple of weeks ago as well, and um, you know, a lot of times it's just walking around town, walking around the Tenderloin, walking around the Mission, 
wherever. That's a lot of good, great people shots that way. One of the things I like that you do is you have an RSS feed. Uh, of course, Flickr has an RSS feed, but you have an RSS feed on your blog. So that means I can add your pictures uh, to my RSS reader or Flipboard or any of the any of the things that aggregate pictures, which makes it nice because every day I get new shots from Thomas Hawk, and they're so. Oh, it is. Yeah, so yeah I love that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you Can I just ask you what your your process is when you go to a new city? You say you use Flickr to find new spots to shoot. Is is that sort of what's your actual process in in discovering new places? Yeah. So so well, a lot of it's that. I mean, I'll start out. I'll just do a lot of research um, on Flickr, doing search searching by that city's tag, um, going through a lot of the pictures. I mean, literally looking at thousands of of different photos. Um, that are that are interesting to me. Um, you know, I save a lot of shots on Flickr as well, and just kind of seeing stuff that looks interesting. And then frequently, you know, more and more with uh, this group I've been involved with with Flickr, uh, we'll set up uh, trips and actually get like eight or nine people. Frequently, there's a local person, so I mean, that's really nice when a couple of locals can come out and uh, and show us some great places to go to. And um, and I found a lot of local people are are great too. And when we went to Dallas, we wanted to get you know, on the roofs of some of the hotels and things like that. And, uh, you know, so we had some local people that were able to help us out and, and, you know, show us how to get up there and do some other things. But, um, yeah, you know, I find there's a lot of local contacts. A lot of it's with a group. A lot of it's just doing research myself ahead of time. Um, uh, you know, but in the end, I have, a, I have a pretty well detailed Google map of what I want to hit and what I need to hit. And, Interesting. And I can then focus also, you know, okay, well, there's, I'm going to shoot this neon sign that's over here, and that's right next to this museum that's over here. And, uh, you know, so I find that if you're highly organized when you get there that's, and you don't waste a lot of time, that you can really focus on what you need to shoot. Thomas has uh, given us three tips for uh, becoming a better photographer. There goes Lisa yeah. one, one more time. So uh, <laughs> we'll get her back, and, uh, and maybe you can give us uh, your tips, starting uh, with tip number one. You, the software that you use. Yeah. You, you said yeah, you I like think, Lightroom. I do. I love Lightroom 3. It's, it's an amazing piece of software, and it's actually a huge improvement, especially the noise reduction stuff over Lightroom 2, the old version. That's but, one of the uh, things that photographers, uh, and certainly we do this, that we ask every photographer, Lightroom or Aperture? Lightroom or Aperture? That's yeah. the, that's, I mean, there are other choices, but that seems to come down to, to one or the other of those. They do. They do. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's like Canon and Nikon, too. You know, it's, They're it, very similar. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm sure Aperture's fine. I've just gravitate more towards the Lightroom. Um, I think the noise reduction technology is a little bit better right now. And, um, but, you know, I think a lot of people will start out and they'll be hesitant to use photo editing software or they'll just do a little bit of editing. And, you know, Ansel Adams is famous for, you know, so much of his genius being done in the dark room. Right. And these photo well, editing software... That's part of the issue. Uh, I think sometimes photographers... Uh, or people who like who watch this show who wonder how much am I allowed to change the photo? And we've talked about it a few sure. times on the shows up to now. And I think that our thought, and I'd love to hear what you think, is that sure. we're not really doing photojournalism. If this were a picture for a newspaper, you wouldn't change it. You wouldn't want to change it or a magazine. Right. But but right. if you if what you think of as what you're doing is fine art, uh, then just as a painter paints a painting, it's okay. But how much do you think it's okay to change your picture? Oh, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, I'm a total photo whore. And I'll, I'll make a photo. <laughs> if I can make a photo look better by doing something to it, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not really doing journalism here. I mean, there are times that I do sort of citizen journalism, like shooting the Oakland riots and stuff like right, that. And right. There's not a lot of change to that. But, you know, yeah, for most of my fine art photography, it's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go any which way. You know, I'll take a, a wall in a, on a warehouse in West Oakland that was blue and turn it green if I want to. Right. Uh, you know, I, 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 and I think that's the license of an artist. I mean, you can really do whatever you want. And so I have no problem with people that use those tools and, and do that. But I think there are some purists out there that sort of insist that, well, no, you can't change that. Right. You can't do that. And I just, I just think that's hogwash. I think, I think, you know, just like Ansel Adams, his original negative was so much different than what his final production piece was out of the dark room. It's the same thing. Of course, Adams is an interesting case because because he's shooting large format film and unlike a digital camera, really doesn't know what he's got in the camera. He, he yeah. I'm sure, spent a lot more time pre-visualizing, planning. He probably only shot one or two or three images at a time, right? Because if they're big, they're large, they're hard to take. I don't imagine well, he, he went through 100 shots every time. And he had to carry those huge plates. Right. Uh, 
Robert Scoble and I went up and, and visited his son oh, and spent, I, spent a weekend with his son. I love great, those pictures and, and stories that Robert shared from that uh, trip. Yeah, we had a great time Amazing. up there. But, but yeah, he'd tell us stories about his, his, you know, his father you know, backpacking out there and with these huge, giant black right. glass plates. So, yeah, you, you only got a certain amount of shots. And I think in general that's one of the things about film that so is attractive is that you do really – there's a temptation with digital to, to you know <laughs> – just overshoot, shoot as you say, yeah. overshoot. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, well, we'll throw out the, the 90 bad and keep the one good one. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it would be a good discipline one day to say, I've got 10, I'm going to take 10 shots today. Yeah, yeah. Let me think I, about friend, what they are. A friend of mine for a while went through a discipline where he said he's only allowed to take one shot a day. And he had to think about it all day and think wow. what a shot was going to be. And, I mean, I couldn't do that. That's just not my style. I, You know, I want to just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And um, to me, storage is so... I mean, relatively inexpensive. I mean, I've got five Grobos, and, you know, you can get a two-terabyte drive these days for, what, you know, 95 bucks or whatever? Well, this is when, as you say, software becomes very important because you have to be able to process that many images quickly and efficiently. Well, you do, yeah. And, and, I, think, and I think Lightroom does a really good job with that. I've been super happy with it, uh, certainly more than Photoshop. You know, I can just crank through them right. very quickly. Um, so, you know, the first, the first tip really is using edit and editing software package, specifically, specifically also with Lightroom, the presets, you know, getting some good, getting hold of some good presets, which aren't what the final photo is, but is kind of a jumping off spot for it. Do you um, uh, make your own? Do you, buy, do you get others' presets? Where do you get your presets? Uh, I've made a lot my, of my own. Um, I've also had friends that uh, we've traded presets, and I found some very good ones online. Um, uh, you know, Kelly Castro, who works down at Adobe, uh, he goes by Kelco, um, he's given me some uh, and he's put some out there that have been published that I think are really good. Um, Adobe's so pretty good about sharing those presets. I have some Adobe presets as well. Yeah. Do you yeah, share this, yours? Um, I, well, I do quite a bit, yeah, except some of the ones that have, people have given to me and they've asked me not to share them. Um, I don't, but I have an, anything that I've made myself. Uh, you know, I've shared with people in the past that have asked for them. So, yeah, using an editing software package, I mean, that's important. Doing your metadata in the editing software package, so rather than tagging, say, on Flickr or things like that, actually tagging and titling your photos, the keywords and the titles in Lightroom or whatever package you're using, I think that also makes it easier than they could automatically populate those fields when you upload. So I think there's a lot of things you can leverage the efficiency of a strong editing software package like Lightroom to really ramp up your production. Um, so that's certainly, for me, that would be a big tip for anybody starting out. Uh, it may seem like a lot, some of these packages to buy them. Um, uh, I know there's a student discount on Lightroom that you can get to, though, if you're a student. But I think investing in that is, you know, if someone says, well, I, I'm going to buy a, a new lens or I'm going to buy, you know, Lightroom or something, I'd say buy Lightroom hands down. Really? And with, with, yeah. uh, with Lightroom, you can actually get a 30-day demo as well if you wanted to try it beforehand. Which is great. Yeah, which is absolutely great. Try it, and if you like it. Um, but I think it just adds so much. I mean, so I would say for myself personally, probably 50% of the photo happens in camera and 50% of it happens in Lightroom. So it's, it's a pretty big chunk of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So and certainly the efficiency side. Um, tip number, kinda, do you want to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, tip number two. Yeah. Go, oh, number two. Yeah. Tip number two, um, photo critique groups, I think are great. Um, I've been involved with them at, on Flickr for a long time. Um, I started the first uncensored group on Flickr, oh, probably over five years ago, I think. But um, one of the things I like about critique groups, and there's lots of different styles of critique groups. I'm not as big of a fan of the groups on Flickr where you just throw your photo in and everybody tells you how great you are and they <laughs> love you. Oh, uh, shoot. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, those are fun. No. No, the, uh, the group that I'm most involved with right now is a group called uh, Hotbox Uncensored, which is just Flickr slash groups uh, HBU. And um, it, basically, it's a group where you submit a photo into a pool. Um, other people critique the photo and vote on it. They either give it a save vote or a delete vote. Um, oh, wow. Can... So it's like uh, Survivor. A little bit, yeah. But it's, but it's the point of the group is kind of to be, you know, really brutally honest. Uh, so... You know, if somebody says, hey, this crop really sucks or and you can read some of the comments probably on some of these photos right now. And they're not always, uh, you know, they're not always the nicest. And sometimes they're, they're really critical and sometimes they're not. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's a way and it's not always val valid feedback, but it is a way to get some valid feedback. And I've really used it over the years to improve my own photography. Um, 
You so have to be a little brave. You, you do. You have to have a thick skin, and you have to, and it's probably not the best place to throw a photo of, uh, you know, your, your daughter's fourth grade birthday party or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you have to be a little serious about what you're doing, too. Right. I mean, yeah. or where you're going to be hurt by the criticism. Um, right. And you do have to have sort of, sort of thick skin, but it's a way that people can put different styles of photo photographs up, and I think it appeals to a lot of people because... They say, hey, I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl, I can, you know, sort of take the criticism, I can take the, the, the you know, the heat. And, and I found if you take, you know, you got to take some of the comments with a grain of salt, but if you, but you do get good comments quite a bit and, and comments that help you improve. And I know for both myself as well as the thought of other members of the group over the years using these sort of, you know, more uncensored critique groups have is, is really done great things for my photography. Right. Oh. Um, so... So, so that would be, uh, you know, that'd sort of be number tip number two, is to look into groups like that. And Hotbox Uncensored isn't the only one. Um, it's this a, one is a invite only, so you'd have to uh, apply to join the group, yeah? Well, no, no, anybody oh, can you, join. Anybody can join, okay. Yeah, you should be able to join. The only thing is, it's, it's because it's an uncensored group, ah. it's, um, it, it's 18 plus, and okay. so... If you, if you don't have your Flickr settings set up to allow 18 plus content... Allow the kittens. Yeah, right. Take me back to the kittens. Take me back to the kittens, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish there were actually a, a checkbox that says no kittens. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's Although what I have, want. We do have a joke in the group that's, uh, that's about Saturday being Catter Day, so sometimes people do submit cats. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's also a good group. We do, we, uh, we're doing a book, a magazine. Uh, we've got an outside blog. Uh, we've done some photo walks. We've done some trips. This so it's also great. the threads inside the group, not just the photo critique or... It's a real, it's a real good community of photographers. So I've enjoyed being associated with that. And uh, and actually, and you can you can post messages like doing mostly photo this afternoon. And yeah, all, exactly, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I posted that, and and people respond. And so there's a yeah, like I say, there's a great community of people there. That's and neat. So, sometimes they go after each other a little hard, but um, you do you know, feel like part of growing as a photographer really is getting a thick skin with commentary and criticism? Uh, I do, yeah. I do. I mean, I think that if you start out as a photographer and you're too sensitive about your work and you can't take the criticism, you know, I, I personally, I, you know, I like it when people are brutally candid with my own photography. And I mean, I don't always agree with what they say. And sometimes they get things really wrong. I mean, in one of these voting groups at one point, uh, somebody submitted sort of anonymously a photo uh, by Cartier-Bresson, who's, you know, widely regarded as one of the greatest photographers who's ever lived. And, you know, and then watch that photo get deleted by the, you know. <laughs> interesting, interesting <laughs> so, experiment. <laughs> yeah, it was Mario's bike. It's his famous picture he took uh. of a bike overlooking from a balcony. And, and you know, li listening to people saying, well, you know, it's, it's a little too blurry. Or, you know, maybe you could come back at a different time of day. And stuff like that with, with somebody who's, you know, widely considered one of the great masters of photography. Well, the, so. thing, the thing that cracks me up is that they didn't recognize... Mario's bike. I mean, yeah, that's good. yeah. one of yeah. The, one of the cla a classic photo, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. a yeah. There's a great um, you know. So so you have to, again. You have to take the critiques with a grain of salt. But uh, you know, I think that a, a lot of points have been made uh, that I've taken to heart and that have helped me. And 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 as much the community that you end up getting involved with and getting to really know other photographers and um, you know and 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 knowing their work as well on a, on a better level. So. Yeah. So I think critique groups like that are, I mean, groups in general, I think are social groups for photographers are great. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, I particularly like some of the harsh critique groups and uh, have gotten a lot of, out of those. As long as it doesn't dis you know, discourage you and you have enough think, confidence in what you're doing. I think for me personally, I, I'm a little bit more sensitive. <laughs> Maybe it's, uh, it depends on what, what the subject is of my photos. But I, I think at the end of the day, you have to be confident in your own work and learn how to edit and critique your own work even before it goes on Flickr. And once you have those tools, be confident in your photos. I mean, uh, some of my pictures that I think are, are great, I get totally hacked to bits on Flickr. <laughs> and, you know, people comment on things that I purposely put there. You know, sometimes with my architecture pictures, they'll be slightly leaning because I'll be using a wide-angle lens, and they'll say, why Why didn't you fix this? And I said, well, that's I, that's how I want it. So at the end of the day, you're, you're an artist. You're creating these shots. So even if people are sort of hacking you down, you have to remain sort of confident in your own in your own work. Oh, absolutely, you do. You do. And you have to have that, I think, self-confidence before you... And these groups are not for everybody. 
But I think if you sort of have that confidence and say, you know, hey, I don't care if someone says this is lousy because right. I'm confident about it and I like it and here, this is why I like it. And, um, you know, I know a lot of photos, you know, again, by like the masters would get would get trashed. So, right. you know, if, if you understand that and take take that with that perspective going in. But, yeah, no, it's definitely not for everybody. Um, if, if somebody <laughs> really wants that. You know, if they're if they're really sort of more sadomasochistic oriented and like that, then it's good for them. I, I like what you said, Lisa. Though I think that's really an important thing to remember that you're if you're an artist, you're expre it's coming from here out. It's not coming from in, out in. And uh, no no great artist creates stuff because that's what people tell them to create. They create it because it's what's coming out of their heart. So I think that's a that's a really important thing to remember that will also give you the confidence to survive these critique groups. Yeah. And this is yeah. what's interesting about photography. It is both an art and a science. There's te there's a lot of technical stuff. There's a lot of technique that you have to learn. And uh, and there are there are kind of things like composition and so forth that there are rules that need you know you can learn you can break them once you learn them but you need to learn them and these critique groups help you with that stuff I think. I mean, at yeah, the I, end of the day, it's it's all about what you're passionate your about. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 remaining true to yourself. And if you really believe in a shot, then you know really we're we're doing photography because we love it and because we enjoy it and we love sharing our work not necessarily to have the very very best photos that everyone agrees upon you can open up any magazine and sometimes I'll even look at a magazine like Vogue which really is is like a fashion bible and you know you open it up and you say well that that's just kind of blurry why is it like that and you think well that's gone through all the editors at Vogue and it's <laughs> they thought it's an amazing photo they must have liked it <laughs> They also like it. As, so sometimes it's it's just about it's this uh, intangible thing that you can't really put your finger on why a shot is great and why it's it's not great. But it's really about what you enjoy shooting. And if you want to become a better photographer, obviously you have to learn to take criticism and to you know make your photos better for more people. But really staying confident and true to yourself is important to develop your own style and to not be shaken by Tom, criticism. Thomas, have you ever taken a picture that you just loved and that everybody hated? But you Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that happens to me and I'm fine with that. I mean, I'll, I'll take a photo and I'll say, boy, you know, I know when I see, you know, this photo, this is one of my works that I feel the most proud of and, and happy with. And then I'll, then I'll take another photo that I'll put up there that I'll say, you know, geez, really, this is sort of a cliche shot. And it's not something that, I, you know, I was particularly really proud of. And all of a sudden, that shot will end up with 100 favorites. Well, that's like the that. risk. That's absolutely the risk on, uh, on critiquing. If you're on Instagram and you take a picture of a sunset, guaranteed, <laughs> guaranteed popular. Do you use Instagram? You know, I wish I did. Um, it's, they don't have it out for Android yet. And I switched to Android last year. So you and me both, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know. I, 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 you know, a lot of my friends use it and you it's know, fun. It's, great. it's yeah. you know, but I don't, do you take pictures with your iPhone or your Android I do, phone? Yeah, I use vignette. Well, I mean, with vignettes, my Android, I vignettes, vignettes, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Vignette works. And I share them on TwitPic and, um, you know, every now and again, and, you know, personally, a lot of people knock sort of some of the iPhone stuff and the hipstamatic or Instagram, or I, I've been impressed with some of the creative things people can do with, with such a limited camera. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think, you know, there's the old saying, the best camera is the one you have with you and all that, but uh, and my DSLR is always with me. But, um, you know, for I think a lot of people, I've been really, really surprised at what they're able to do with, with Instagram and Hipstamatic and Vignette and programs like that on the phone. One last tip, focusing yeah, so, on the, the, a project. Yeah, projects. I think, I think projects are really key, and particularly, um, you know, Lisa had emailed me earlier this week and talked about, you know, well, what do you do for inspiration and this and that, and... Um, you know, I don't think it matters what the project is. Uh, myself, personally, I've got a number of different projects that I'm working on simultaneously and continuously. Um, one project that I'm doing uh, that I started a few years back is uh, my $2 portraits project. And I just, I was shooting up in Portland and walking across one of the bridges, listening to my headphones. Yeah, that's it right there. And um, this guy kind of stops me. And, you know, I just thought he was a homeless guy asking me for money and I didn't want to give him money. And I was shooting this bridge and uh, it wasn't really meant, meaning to shoot him. And, and, you know, he said something to me again, a motion that I take my headphones off, which is, you know, really rude. I had my headphones on and wasn't even acknowledging the guy as a human being. And so I, I you know, I, I said to him even before I heard him, you know, uh, I don't have any money. 
Oh, and boy. then I, I, yeah, and then I realized when I took the headphones off, he's like, I'm not asking you for money. I wanted you to take my picture. You know, will oh, you take my picture? Man. Oh, yeah, and then man. I felt, I mean, I just felt awful yeah. Uh, yeah. and guilty. And so, you know, and, and really bad. And so I took, a, I took that picture of that gentleman, which turned out to be an enormously popular photo online and on Flickr and, um, uh, you know, won some contests. And they did a, they did a series on it on, on um, uh, the CBC, on the Canadian Public Broadcasting uh, radio a while back and um, it's stunning actually yeah it turned out great and it was just a stranger on a bridge and it was a brief interaction and kind of what that spawned for me is this uh, this awareness in me that hey you know maybe I shouldn't be just trying to avoid all these people asking me for money and so that's sort of my two dollar portrait project which I've taken now um, you know a number of photographs of you know people ask me for money and I'm telling them about my project I say hey I'm doing this two dollar portrait project and I'll give you two dollars and I'll take your portrait and You'll have earned the money and, uh, you know, by modeling briefly, and I'll get a little bit about them for a story, uh, just, you know, a couple of uh, paragraphs, and, and I'll publish that. So, you know, that's just one example. You know, I've got, I've got projects focusing on neon signs. I'm doing cemetery projects. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of different ones. Some people do the 365. I, I've never sort of gotten into that myself, but um, there are so many different things you can focus on for projects, and I think – even when you sort of run out of inspiration and you run out of things to shoot, if you've got an active project that you're engaged mm -hmm. in that, that you can be focused on, um, if nothing else, you can just return to that subject matter, that project, and work on it. One thing I noticed you, you, in your photo stream is every photo has a title. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that? You know, for me, um, the title is a large part of the image. Um, you know, Chris you know, Marquardt always says that he hates it when he comes to an image and it's P zero 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 six four three one two. Yeah, yeah. My, I mean, my titles um, oftentimes are, are intensely personal. Um, I recognize about, mother. Should I trust the government? I know where that comes from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so a lot, a lot of them come from music, actually. Yeah. I mean, quite a bit. Uh, because you know, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm emotionally moved and touched by music all the time, and so. Um, uh, you know, a lot of them do come from music. A lot of them just come out of my head. I just make up. Um, a lot of them, something that I see or feel or hear. Sometimes it's something in the photo. Oh, there's the scobalizer. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, some of them will be descriptive. Um, they'll just be. Sometimes know. it's poetry, though. I mean, yeah. Some, I mean, sometimes it just says a guy's name, but sometimes it's poetry too. Which I, for yeah, instance, I that uh, that uh, two dollar photo, the photo that inspired yeah. two dollar photo. Um, the, the title of it is, uh, let me go back to it, Angels oh, are Messengers from God. Right, right. And that, that's, actually, that's actually a line from a Whiskey Town song, which is a band, and a beautiful song. But for me, I almost had this feeling, I mean, I don't think this man was literally an angel, but... Well, I he had, had a message for you, didn't he? He did, he did. Did it, you it ever get that picture to him? You know, I, I never did. Uh, in, in part, I was so sort of embarrassed by offending him uh, that I just kind of quickly took the picture and moved on. And right. I, I'd love to, I'd love to track the guy down at some point someday and, and give him a picture, a copy of it and tell him how much yeah. it, that particular photograph meant to me so cool. and how it actually radically changed the way that I interact with people out on the street. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, in a way for me, there's sort of a spiritual almost side of it where, you know, it, he is sort of like an angel that's sort of, created a transformation in my own work and how I treat people on the street. And I do a lot of street photography. And, and subsequent to that, I think I've gotten some wonderful and warm and engaging portraits in my $2 portrait series. But I've also gotten some wonderful human encounters with, with real, authentic human connection with people. And, uh, you know, so I, 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 think, I think sometimes photography can do stuff like that. And, um, you know, someday I do hope that I can track him down and, and give him a copy of the, of the print okay. and talk to him again. Yeah. Thomas Hawk is our guest on uh, Mostly Photo. Lisa Bettany, I apologize because you're hearing a lot more of me than you would normally, but <laughs> Lisa's in New York City with a bad Wi-Fi connection, I think. Oh, sorry. No, I, no, don't apologize. It's not your fault, but uh, I apologize for taking up hogging so much of Thomas's time. <laughs> Although I'm such a fan and I've, and I've never met Thomas and always wanted to talk to him. So it's a, it's a, a oh, this thrill is great. for me to get yeah. to talk to you a little bit. Uh, I guess we should ask, Lisa, we should always ask everybody uh, this question. What, Thomas, what do you shoot? Yeah, um, I shoot in my bag. Um, I use a low pro bag and that goes with me everywhere I go pretty much 24 seven. 
I'm always waiting for that spot news story that might show up. Um, but I shoot with a Canon 5D Mark II, which I love. Um, I've got in my bag uh, five lenses. I've got a 14 millimeter uh, f2.8, a 24 millimeter f1.4, a 50 millimeter f1.2, a 100 millimeter f2.8 macro, um, all Canon. And the and my favorite lens, which is the Canon 135 f2, which is just. And I you carry just, this everywhere? Everywhere. Wow. Everywhere. You must have. Everywhere I go. She, she's going to say you have arms of steel, but I think her connection yeah. dropped again. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. That's real dedication, you know, and I think that's every pro I know has a pocket camera. Uh, nowadays, a lot of them use their uh, phone camera because they don't want to carry that big, heavy SLR. And how many lenses? Four lenses around with them. Yeah, yeah, five lenses. Five uh, lenses, but you're dedicated, five. obviously. I'm dedicated and I'm committed to it, and it's a lifestyle for me. I figure, you know, I get a little exercise more having that to do before I go. So, <laughs> and it's a low dollars. pro. So, is it uh, which which one? Which low pro is it? Is it is it a backpack? It's a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty bulky backpack. It's a pretty serious uh, low pro backpack, and so so I use that. And then I also have other stuff in there. I've got my. I mean, one of the best things that I bought uh, in the past couple of years has been a, a FireWire 800 card reader. Yeah, I mean, that it makes just, a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah, so much faster than USB or direct connecting the camera or. So I got that. I also in my bag I've got um, I've got an, an Arctic Butterfly sensor cleaner that I clean dust off my sensor with. I've got um, you know a cable release. You know I got a, a tripod that I bring back out with me when I go. My so, MacBook Pro goes with me everywhere I go. With Lightroom on it, yeah. With Lightroom on it, yeah, yeah. Somebody asked, of course, in the chat room, and I I, I probably don't need to ask this, but you shoot raw, I would guess. Oh yeah, oh, definitely yeah. shoot raw. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Shoot no raw. question. Yeah, Roz, uh, you know, I know there's some sort of debate about that, and I just, I don't see what? the debate. I don't see a debate. Yeah. No. I guess, Why let the camera mess your picture up when you can mess it up perfectly well all by yourself? Right, right. Now, I, I mean, I, I love the flexibility that Raw gives me and, the, you know, the, the room for error there and, and ways that I can adjust later. So. Yeah. Well, uh, Thomas, great tips, and uh, we really appreciate uh, those tips. Of course, Thomas's website is thomashawk.com. He's Thomas yep. Hawk on Flickr as well, and he's also uh, Thomas Hawk on uh, Twitter. Yep. And I'm going to give you a little plug for the Twitter stream too, because uh, there's always good stuff. In hey, there. thanks, Leo. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I do you use Buzz at all anymore, or is it just kind of a you know, automatic I a, now? I left a comment on Buzz today, so you know I do get back there not as much as I used to. There's not the activity that there used to be, Leo. I mean, I know. I mean, you, I'm sad. You about remember? It. I mean, Buzz was so great, and because for I photographers it. it would show fairly large thumbnails of the picture. Much better than Twitter. Yeah. yeah, I mean, much better. But you know, if the people aren't there and that's not where the audience is, uh, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know what Google could have done different. And uh, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of Buzz over the years. But you know, I, I really wish that it had taken off because it was such a such a great platform for photographers with those nice big pictures, with you know, piping your uh, Flickr stream into it. And, uh, it's it's you know, I, I miss it. Yeah, you and I and Scoble. All yeah. threw our heart and soul into it. And our, we and, sure did. And got yeah, our we hearts sure broken. Yeah. <sighs> Sigh. <laughs> so, uh, Lisa, guess what? We've got some winners. Yes, I'm very excited. I was... I loved all the entries. Thank you so much for entering so many pictures in our photo contest on the Flickr group, Mostly Photo. And keep, please keep sharing your photos there because I love looking at them. So uh, if you, you can see these very easily by going to Flickr and our Mostly Photo group, it's Mostly Photo, all one word, or go to MostlyPhotoAdventures.com and click the Winners tab. Now we have, uh, we're going to do it again uh, this week. Each winner gets a... Uh, one hundred dollar gift certificate to Am. Let me see. I have it right here. To Am. I want to make sure I say it right. To Amazon.com. And there are two winners. Uh, you get uh, you get a, a a People's Choice Award winner, and we'll explain how that works in just a little bit. And then a Judges Award winner. I'll start with the Judges Award because well, Lisa's the judge. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us uh, tell us why you liked this particular picture. It's by Gabriel Asaf. And well, it's more honestly, the, the amount of effort that goes into hiring a model, getting a stylist and a makeup artist, it's such a beautiful shot, natural light, um, great 
I, I've been following this girl for quite a while, and she's really an inspiration to anyone who wants to start to get into fashion photography and someone that's used Model Mayhem to find models, and now I think she's using models from actual modeling agencies. And, and I know how, how difficult it is to approach a stylist and a makeup artist and to organize a shoot and to come up with a theme, and I just think this is such a beautiful springtime portrait fashion shot yeah i love the color too it's very muted colors but uh but that brings out the the features and uh you focus less mm -hmm. on the color and more on her beautiful face yeah that's a great picture so that's a hundred dollar uh amazon certificate to gabrielle asaf get yourself a couple of 16 gig uh, high speed cards or or one of those firewire 800 readers that uh, thomas was talking about <laughs> yeah. it, it really does make a difference i have to say and this is our People's Choice Award, Fireworks Friday. Another shot of wishes from Paul Gowder. I like this. I like this yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's difficult. I, so many people take firework photos, and this I looks like a publicity anyone, but... still. This is amazing. Yeah. Wow. And the color again, beautiful. So both of you win a hundred dollar Amazon gift certificate, compliments of Ford, and the all new one hundred percent reinvented. Ford Explorer, thank you, Ford. Uh, boy, I just I, I'm I'm thrilled that we can uh, do this because it gives you a chance to take more pictures, and perhaps get some recognition on the air, which is probably in some ways worth more than the uh, gift certificate. But I'm sure both are appreciated. Um, here's how it works: we're going to give two awards every week, um, but each week we'll select three finalists. I'm about to show you the finalists from this week. So. Here's what you should do is take a picture, submit your best picture to the Mostly Photo Group on Flickr. That's Mostly No Space Photo on Flickr. And if you're not already a member of the group, it's easy, it's free. If you're not on Flickr, it's easy, it's free. Just go to FLICKR.com and then go to the groups. Once you sign up, go to the groups tab and search for Mostly Photo One Word. You'll know you're in the right spot when you see thousands of <laughs> pictures and thousands of members. And you know, it's fun. I think we can do what you were talking about, Thomas, here and, and use this as a way uh, to comment on uh, on shots as well. I mean, uh, this is a chance for us to do our own critiquing, and everybody will be Absolutely. very nice in here. Yeah. <laughs> this is the nice critique group. The nice Not critique. Exactly. Yeah. So we're ready for our week two uh, finalists. And again, mostly photoadventures.com to see these. These are the three finalists now that Lisa's picked. Winners will be announced on our next episode. Vote now through May 1st. Here's how you vote. Go on Twitter and use the unique Twitter hashtag under your favorite photo. It makes it very easy for us to count. We've got Joshua Gunther. Beautiful cityscape there. That's hashtag mostly photo award four, all one word. Andre Faubert's picture... I wonder if he used a uh, an iPhone tool that we picked on MacBreak Weekly as a as a oh, I bet the he, tiny world. The, I think he did, didn't he? It's very cool. I it, it's a technique I've yet to try, but I was yeah, I'm really fascinated yeah. by it. it it's what, Canadian. <laughs> is it what's it called? Tiny world. Well, that's the t technique. Or tiny world. Oh, I see. It's world. a technique. Yeah, there is mm -hmm. a there's an app on the iPad I think that does this. That uh, I know we picked it on iPad today. So that's cool. But, but I guess you could do it yourself, Lisa, with Photoshop? Yeah. I, I really want to try this out. So yeah. it's something I've... It's great cool. color. Both Isn't it? And there's the Joshua yeah. Gunter. Boy, that's, that's obviously an HDR and just gorgeous. <gasps> what city is that? You should know. You've been to the 100 biggest cities in the... Yeah. You know, I, I can't tell. It doesn't look familiar to Houston, me. Houston, maybe? Maybe. Oh, I'm maybe going... Austin? I don't know. Because of the lake? I don't know. Probably says if I look. And then yeah. this from C. Vicchio. Oh, talk about simple. Beautiful. Yeah, silhouettes are great. Yeah, kind of a lone pine. Um, some very different styles here. This is actually a great trio of pictures you picked, Lisa, because it just shows three very different ways to do pictures. I love that. So uh, you, if you go to uh, mostlyphotoadventures.com slash finalists, uh, you'll see the Twitter hashtags. Everybody tweet now. I'm going to I'm going to hold off cuz I don't want to bias anybody with my pick. And I and, well no, I'll tell you the truth, I can't pick. Mostly Photo <laughs> Award 4, 5 and 6 our next set will announce our winner um, next week. And uh, do you know put comments on there when you when you go to the photos on the Flickr group too and talk about why you like the photo. You have until 
May 1st to get your tweet in. Might, we might count them later just to make sure everybody gets a chance before our next mostly photo show. And again, thanks to Ford and the uh, great folks at Ford and their 100% reinvented 2011 Ford Explorer, which we love taking on the road for our uh, photo walks. Oh, Lisa's gone off again. She's probably <laughs> gone out to take some pictures, knowing her. I'll dial her in again. It's that in-room Wi-Fi that kills us every time. Um, very, very cool choices. I won't let. I won't have. A, I won't put you on the spot, <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> We do want to mention, of course, the uh, 2011 Ford Explorer. In fact, let's do this now while I try to get Lisa uh, back on. And then we have some Q&A for Thomas and uh, Lisa. I rented one of those Ford Explorers in, uh, when I was in uh, Dallas in Fort Worth. Really? Why? Uh, the, the car at the counter, they asked me if I wanted a Ford Explorer instead of the regular car so I had done. And, <laughs> well, we, had, uh, I, I was, we were moving around, I think, you know, six photographers. And so wow. it was perfect because we crammed everybody into the thing and we... We're back and forth between Dallas and Fort Worth, which is a nice drive, uh, a few times and uh, got everybody in the thing. And it, it drove great. I liked it. I'm told that's Los Angeles, by the way. Uh, what's Los Angeles? That picture. Not, oh, not, that's not your story, the picture. I'm going oh, back in time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> chat, room, chat room got me that information. Yeah. Uh, Citibank, it's the Citibank Tower building in uh, Los Angeles. That, that's how, how they figured it out. Yeah, uh, the, no, these Explorers are great if you've got, they've got uh, three rows of seating for up to seven people, so you can easily get those six photographers in, plus a lot of gear. Um, in fact, if you have even more gear, the second and third rows fold flat to give you 80.7 cubic feet of space. That's a lot. And, of course, that 3.5-liter V6 engine is enough for a lot of fat photographers. 290 horsepower and 255 foot-pounds of torque. Towing capacity of up to 5,000 pounds with the optional towing package. So you can haul a boat, camper, or trailer, or just uh, a darkroom behind you. Or a ho Hasselblad. Or a Hasselblad. <laughs> Big enough for Ansel Adams and all his uh, slide film. What do they call those? Those glass plates. Yeah. And with 25 highway miles per gallon, that's best in class uh, from the EPA. That's pretty impressive. Don't forget, of course, we love the My Ford. Did you? Did yours have My Ford Touch uh, built into it? Uh, I don't remember that. No. Oh, you would. It's got an eight-inch screen in the center, then two little screens behind the steering wheel, uh, and so you control the climate, you control everything in the car, all your music, make phone calls by voice and touch, and it's just so sweet. Uh, huh. It is. Oh. I, just I just remember that my friend Troy Holden got mad at me because all I did was play the country music all, <laughs> all the time. It was in Texas. We had that same problem when we drove the Ford Explorer around Las Vegas. One of our staff members, who shall remain nameless, is not a fan of country music. <laughs> I happen to like it. I like it too. Yeah, especially if you're in Texas. Right, right. Thanks to Ford and the uh, 2011 Ford Explorer for bringing us the Mostly Photo Adventure Awards. Okay, Lisa's back. Lisa, I'm sorry. This must just be frustrating as heck for you. Hi. Uh. <laughs> All right, but we we got you back, and we'll just I'll just keep calling. You keep hanging up on me, and I'll keep calling. Okay. It's the story of our relationship all along, anyway. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, let us get to here's our audience questions. We've got one from Chad Chainsaw Me Tunin. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why they call him Chainsaw. <laughs> I am really interested in the general laws surrounding photography. This is one for both of you, really, but I think, Thomas, you've become an expert yeah. on this. Aside from being able to take pictures of anything in public, I know pretty much nothing about the laws regarding photo taking. Does the law about public photography, for instance, extend into public buildings like libraries? If you want to take pictures in a private location like a store, what kind of permission do you need first? I've heard stories of photographers being harassed even to the point of police being called while taking photos, and I'd like to know if the law is on my side. I think it's relevant in a post-911 world where people tend to read into everything we do and say, always love the show, keep it up. And I have to say that I think this is true, uh, Thomas, that post-911, people have gotten much more sensitive about taking pictures, especially in train stations and places, uh, transportation places, where I guess they figure terrorists might be taking pictures. Oh, they have, and I mean, some of it's just silly and stupid. I mean, I had the FBI come to my house. What? Is, uh, yeah, yeah. I was shooting uh, an, an oil refinery what? down in yeah, from <laughs> down in Long Beach. I was shooting one of the oil refineries from a public sidewalk, you know, perfectly legal. 
And, uh, you know, they uh, cop had stopped us and detained us. And next thing you know, um, FBI shows up at my house. And I get a call from my wife saying, why is the FBI showing up? Oh, but, boy. Um, wow. <laughs> and I called the guy and he's like, um, you know, I'm just following up and you don't have any feelings of ill will towards the United States government, do you? Jeez. <laughs> like yeah. terrorists get yelled at. I, I've never had the FBI yeah. come after me. Well, the other thing I don't understand is does a terrorist say, oh, yes, I do. I mean, well, that's the thing. I mean, it, it, <laughs> what kind of terrorist is out there with a, a tripod and, and setting it up on a sidewalk and taking 45 minutes to take a picture of, right. uh, you know, I mean, I love those long exposures with those lights on the refineries and stuff like that. But and yet I understand. And, you know, we certainly have the need for um, uh, security. Um, so there, I guess what I would say is there's the law and then there's practice. And certainly nobody wants to get in trouble with the FBI. So is the law that you could take a picture in a public place at any time, anywhere? Well, by public place, you know, my understanding of the law is certainly any, uh, you know, street, sidewalk, outside place that's a public place, um, you know, you're allowed to take pictures in America. Uh, as far as I know, I don't know of any place that you can't from a public place. Now, inside a private building, even a government-owned building, they can set restrictions right. about, you know, what you can take inside the building. And that but, includes malls? It even yeah. includes, like, the sidewalk in front of the Bellagio Hotel? That's correct. Yeah, as long as it's uh, is public property that you're shooting from. Um, I mean, obviously there are some laws about if a, you know if a shot if, if something is intended to be private, you can't sit on the sidewalk and shoot into your neighbor's bathroom while they're taking a shower. Uh, yeah, but that would, you know, that wouldn't if, be good. Yeah, but but if people have an ex expectation of privacy uh. from the public area, but if there's no expectation of privacy. You know, if you want to take pictures of, uh, you know, the White House or the Bellagio or right. an oil refinery or, you know, really any of that, it's all perfectly legal and you're perfectly within your rights. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to get hassled for it and you're not going to get told that you can't. And, um, you know, my friend, uh, my friend Clearlight and I were shooting down in L.A. neon signs a couple weeks ago and, uh, you know, in front of a nightclub uh, down in L.A. in kind of a bad neighborhood, but we were taking a picture of the sign and, the security guard there just says, you know, you can't take pictures here. But, but you know, of course you can. You can, yeah. So that's what I told him. I said, no, no, I can. You know. And then sure. what? Did he beat you up? No, no, we didn't have much of an altercation. You know, I, I find 90% of the time if you're really confident with them and just, right. talk, you know, be polite, but talk back and insist on your right to shoot. I mean, I do. Um, you know, every now and again, you'll run into a really ugly situation. And I blogged some of those. But You had you know, trouble I, with the Museum of Art in San Francisco, didn't you? Yeah, that was terrible. That was awful. I got I got thrown out of there by two security guards and the director of visitor relations uh, for shooting the atrium, which is first of all, photography is allowed in the SF MoMA. Um, I was shooting the atrium, which is a there's thousands of shots of it online. I was using a 14 millimeter wide angle lens at capturing a large internal architecture shot, and it rubbed the director of visitor relations the wrong way, and so you know I got forcibly ejected and. Um, you know, so I blogged about that, and that made quite a big deal. And in some ways, I almost felt bad afterwards because it kind of blew up bigger than I really had meant for it to. But um, Well, I think means... it's appropriate to fight for the right to take pictures. I would also say that none of us are lawyers. <laughs> so right. take our legal advice with a grain of salt. And no picture is worth getting beat up or thrown in jail for. So uh, even if you know you have the right to take that picture, consider it. The consequences, and maybe, maybe uh, I, I don't want to say back down. I, I, and, I th and Thomas, you're absolutely somebody who doesn't back down. But I don't want to get our audience beat up either. Well, Leo, you're right, though, and and I and I don't and I have backed down before. You know, for example, I took a I took a photograph that I had put on. Um, I can't remember where I put it on, of some Hell's Angels to tombstones, and they ended up on a on a stock photography site just because it automatically pulled from my Flickr site and. I got an email, a Facebook message from the Hells Angels, and they said, you know, take him down. And I, mean, I don't have to take him down, but, you know, I don't know that I really want to get in an argument or a fight with the Hells Angels <laughs> no. either. No. So, no. you know, so, I mean, I, I have backed down before. And sometimes you want to think about, you know, if some guy's drunk and you're taking pictures of him on the street because he can and he's, right. you know, 300 pounds and he's going to pulverize you because right. he doesn't want his picture taken, then, you know, probably don't take his picture. Yeah. We don't want to lose any of our audience members. Right. <laughs> God knows we can't afford to. Uh, here is a question from Chris. Love the podcast, Lisa. Wondering if you could offer some quick advice. I just started shooting in RAW, and I've never done much with uh, post-processing. 
How do I get started, for instance, and we kind of talked about this, uh, which free and or paid software tips are in performing the processing, other references. I'm going to put in a plug. If you're going to use Lightroom, my friend Mikkel Olin, who we will get on the show, I, I hope soon. He's a great photographer, and uh, he's written two really good uh, Lightroom sh books called The Lightroom Adventure, Adobe Lightroom Adventures. I was on one of the adventures. He did one in Iceland and one in uh, Tasmania. And not only do you get these great photo books, uh, but there are lots of tips, both from Adobe and from the great photographers uh, who he takes with him on how to use Lightroom more efficiently. That's I learned so much from those. But that's just my answer. Uh, why don't we start with Lisa? You're, are you a Lightroom? I can't remember. You're Lightroom, aren't you? I am a Lightroom. I did start on Aperture, and I think it's worth mentioning that you can buy Aperture on the Mac Store yeah. for relatively it's cheap. cheap. Yeah. I think it's eighty-two dollars or something. Yeah. And and that's quite a steal considering Lightroom's going to be upwards in three hundred dollars. So if you are a Mac user and you want to start on something a bit cheaper, you can try Aperture. It's, it's a personal preference uh, whether you use Aperture or Lightroom. They're both great pieces of software. Obviously there's iPhoto that's just built into your Apple computer. Um, Photoshop is obviously a big step up. I don't know, Thomas, do you know any free software that you can use online? You know, there are some free software packages. I know also there's like Picnic, which comes like with your Flickr account that you can use. There's some limited functionality right. and you can buy like a premium version for, you know, something relatively modest, I think like 30 bucks a year or something yeah, like there's that. there's Aviary. Uh, yeah, there are some. I just... And there's, of course, Picasa, but but none of them really have yeah. the, the, the complete functionality that you get with Aperture or Lightroom. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, I, I'm just a huge fan of Lightroom. I can't say enough good things about it. And, uh, you know, the noise reduction technology especially. I mean, it's I amazing. can't believe <laughs> I mean, the, the stuff, with, I tell you, the stuff with the Lightroom noise reduction technology, the new stuff and the three, now between the high ISO cameras, so I can shoot my 5D Mark II at ISO 6400 and fast mm -hmm. lenses and the noise reduction technology to clean those, you know, some of the noise up in those higher ISO shots. I mean, you can basically shoot in the dark without a flash. And the technology, yeah. it, you know, it really, it makes a whole new type of photography available that really wasn't available three, four years ago. Um, so, I, I mean, I love that. I, I'm, a, I'm just a big diehard fan of Lightroom and, you know, spend so many hours on it every week and month and... And I think something you said earlier, which is if instead of spending money on lenses, you know, yeah. invest in Lightroom. And especially if you have an entry level DSLR and you are seeing a lot of noise when you're using ISO 800 or above, it is something that you can get rid of with something like Lightroom. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, I have an entry level DSLR. How do I get rid of this noise? Well. Lightroom's the easiest way. It's just a slider and you're done. And so you're buy good a to cheap go. camera and spend 80 bucks <laughs> on Aperture. Or I guess Lightroom for three two ninety nine isn't that cheap, but it does yeah, a better job. Huh? They do have a student version. So if you're a student, you, ah. you can get like, like 80 bucks or something. Okay. It's a little cheaper. There you go. And they have a 30-day trial, so it's a, it is a good way to kind of Definitely it. try it out. Yeah. And there are certainly so many tutorials online and, like you said, books that you can buy to learn. And, and don't be intimidated by the software. It's, it, you know, it, there's a lot of buttons and sliders and certainly you have to learn your way around. But immediately you can just pop a photo in there and there's just, you know, color, vibrancy, stuff that you can get a grip on really easily and automatically make your photos a lot more dynamic, add a lot more contrast, saturation, and those kind of things that can just make your photos pop without even trying. Yeah, you, you really can. I mean, I, I, I was up at the Conservatory of Flowers on Monday in San Francisco and I took this great shot that I love this, of this lotus flower and it's, uh, I turned it sideways and made it look like a butterfly and you know, a lot of this stuff, it's really not that hard to do. And I found Photoshop, actually, the learning curve on Photoshop is considerably harder. Um, Lightroom just, just flows. That's interesting. So you do you use Photoshop at all? You know, maybe 5% of the time. Huh. You know, but like I, like I said, the thing that I don't like about Photoshop is I'll pull it, because you, you, you can just go straight from Lightroom to Photoshop because they work together. But, you know, I'll, uh, you know, I'll throw a picture into Photoshop and the next thing you know, I get lost and it's, you know, I've wasted an hour. Right. Is this the picture you were referring to? 
Uh, no, although mm. I did take that one at the Conservatory of Flowers. No, this one was a lotus flower. Uh, uh, if, if you look on the same date where it says taken on date, you'll see the other one. Oh. I didn't even, the top there. Isn't that a nice tip? I didn't know I could click that. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. The date, you could click the date, and then here's the other picture. Yeah, there's the other oh, one. That's so. clever. You are so I just... did that in Lightroom, and it's it was just a matter of, uh, you know, that's actually a lotus flower, and, uh, you know, if you turn it sideways the other way and, and, you know, really try to do something a little bit more abstract with it, and, and the colors that I'm able to get out in the background and controlling the vignette and other things like that, I mean, Lightroom just gives you so much more control. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing program. Of course, you can spend a lot of time learning it. You can. You can, although I found it's pretty easy, too, just to jump right in. Yeah. I mean, if you're somewhat computer literate. Mickle has a, uh, I think, a video uh, pr uh, program, too, that uh, if some people like to learn that way. And, of course, Linda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com, has a lot of uh, good tutorials uh, mm -hmm. for that kind of thing. But it's worth, you know, hey, look, you don't want a hobby that you can master in five minutes. What would be the True. fun of that? <laughs> well, it's been great meeting you. Thomas Hawk is at thomashawk.com, and as you can see, he posts an awful lot of pictures on there and on his uh, Flickr stream. If you go to thomashawk.com, you'll find links to all of all of that. It's a it's a wonderful site. Thomas Hawk's Digital Connection. And can you believe it, folks? He's not a full time photographer. He actually has a day <laughs> job and a family. And yet, that's inspiring to me that you take so many pictures. Uh, just fantastic. Well, it's, it's a, a good point to sure. take to take photo weekends and yeah. to really live your hobby. And when you do have a spare moment to grab a lot of shots and then space them out and have sort of daily projects where you are posting, but you're not necessarily, if you don't have time to shoot, and I know I'm certainly one of those people now find it really hard to shoot on a daily basis, but when I do get a chance, I'll take a whole bunch and then post those throughout the week. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think one of the things with Flickr is you do kind of you don't want to just publish everything at once. You want to kind of filter them in there. Um, otherwise, things tend to get lost. I mean, most of your contacts see the last one photo or the right. last five. And uh, you know, I've got a reserve right now. I've got about fifty, I think fifty-four thousand or so on Flickr. Oh, wow. I've <laughs> yeah, I've got a reserve of another uh, twenty-two thousand or so that I pull from every day. So of those fifty photos that I upload a day, I pull from this reserve of about twenty-two thousand. So I'm constantly replenishing that with new processes. Thank you, Thomas. Really nice to meet you. ThomasHawk.com. Good to meet you, Leo, and good to see you, and Lisa, you as well. Yeah. Lisa Bettany, of course, is at MostlyLisa.com. And don't forget Camera Plus, which is her great iPhone application that <laughs> has a lot. It's kind of like Lightroom in an iPhone application in some ways. A lot of presets that she does uh, for you so that uh, you don't have to uh, spend a lot of time messing around with your picture and you get some great results. We're going to end with a uh, video from Vimeo that you picked. Do you, is there a story behind this, Lisa, or is this just... This is just, just, gorgeous. just watch it and it will inspire you a million times over. It's been making the rounds. I think it has millions of views already. Yeah. But if you haven't seen it, certainly something that can inspire you to take your photography to the next level and really get started on your photo projects. And maybe one day. <laughs> I'm going to butcher the pronunciation here, but this is Spain's highest mountain, El Tiede. And uh, the picture actually the movie is by terje sogard or sojard and uh we'll leave you uh, with this and don't for, uh, we don't have another photo walk schedule but don't forget to submit your entry to our uh, our contest our mostly photo adventure awards for a chance to win a hundred dollar amazon certificate and uh of course recognition on the air and and go to mostlyphotoadventures.com slash finalists, folks, uh, so that you can tweet your favorite for the People's Choice Award. You get to pick the People's Choice Award. We thank Ford and the 100% reinvented Ford Explorer from 2011 for bringing us the Mostly Photo Adventure award, uh, Awards and this show. And without further ado, a little video for you of Spain's highest mountain. Is this a time lapse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thomas. Hey, thank you, Leo. Great to talk thank to you. you.